so it, it causes poverty. But AIDS is also caused by, facilitated by poverty. Uh, Mr. Mekke, the president of South Africa, caused a little stir a few years ago when he mentioned this. So there's a misinterpretation. But it is a key issue. It is a key issue. Just to be very concrete, what I know in Zambia, um, a, a mother with maybe two or three children, her husband's gone off somewhere, she doesn't know where, living in an urban compound in Zambia. The children are hungry. Um, the man next door will give the woman some food if she gives them food. Uh, the girl who goes to school, and the family saves all the money possible to get the next girl to the school. And the time comes for the examination because everything has to be paid for. The family doesn't have any money for examinations. The sugar daddy, waiting outside of the school, will give her the money she gives him some. Uh, the young couple, struggling along in a village, making it tough. He'll go to town, earn some money, she'll stay at home. They're separated. Uh, the youth that are graduating from the schools or pushed out of education, one third of children of primary school age are not in school. Two-thirds of children of secondary school age are not in school. What's their future? The poverty situation doesn't cause AIDS, but it provides an environment in which AIDS is tainted and spread. So, the, the simply cannot deal with the question of poverty, with the question of AIDS, without dealing with the issue of poverty. Education is key in that. I worked with a, a Jesuit uh, in Zambia, by Michael Kelly, who's become something of a world expert on the relationship between education and AIDS, in terms of what AIDS is doing to education, but also what education is able to do in terms of the prevention of AIDS. Uh, he's coined a phrase, which has, uh, there's only one vaccine against HIV, and that's education. It doesn't mean that everybody who gets an education is going to not catch HIV, but it does mean that there are possibilities. Uh, there has to be money invested in the health system, because in a deficient health system, um, you're not going to be meeting well the challenges of AIDS. There has to be an investment in nutrition. Um, I'll write on the board in a few minutes or so the website that we have, our center. And if you go to that, the first thing you'll see is something that's produced each month called a basic needs basket. It's simply a, a picture of how much money is required to feed a family of six and some dependents each month. Uh, long story short, about a little less, a little more than 200, maybe 210 dollars per month is required, uh, and the civil servant is going to be taking home maybe less than 100 dollars a month. So it means the household are nutritionally deficient. ARV is a big thing now. There's been a campaign to lower the cost of ARVs or so. But ARVs are toxic. They'll kill. Unless people have the tripod of support of good testing, good nutrition, and good support, psychological support. Good nutrition is central. It's a public policy issue. The conduit is also a public policy issue, but I'll save that for any questions we might come up. A fourth public policy issue think of Africa, and sometimes I, I'm hesitant to kind of read a list off like this because it sounds so bad, because I see so many good things happening in Africa, but when I come to the States, I see so many bad things being reported on. But one of the things that's reported on is conflicts, because there have been conflicts. Civil wars, ethnic clashes, cross-border wars. Thank God, not in Zambia. But it's important to go to the root cause. Those tribes are always fighting against each other. Ethnic clashes. Frequently, ethnic clashes is just an excuse for someone who wants to stay in power and they identify their enemy as coming from another tribe. Uh, Rwanda is a tremendous tragedy. I was just talking to someone about the movie that's going on now. If you watch that movie, don't think it's just Hutu and Tutsi. Think a little bit about history. Pick up a history book of Rwanda. Look at the role of the French in terms of one tribe in favor of against another tribe. Tribes that lived in peace and harmony before colonialism. Look deeper. Why doesn't, 
Why is there ethnic clashes in Zambia? 72 tribes, seven major ones. Because the first president, Kenneth Cohen, has said, our motto is one Zambia, one nation. You're a member from the southern province, from the northern province, you go to teach in the southern province. And we're in Tonga, and maybe marry a Tonga. Balancing in the cabinet. Balancing in business arrangements. He made a commitment to one Zambia, one nation. That's why today Zambians are just just cannot understand what would be happening in some neighboring countries in terms of some of this clash between the tribes. Go a little deeper too in terms of what are the causes of, of this clash. Tremendous clashes and conflicts in Angola, the country next to us, because one group held diamonds and the other group held oil. They wanted, the one held oil, wanted to hold the diamonds, the one held the diamonds, wanted to hold the oil. It went on. Dafur, you've heard of Dafur. Why is that going on? Well, it's because the northerners are Arabs and black, and the southerners are Bantu and black, and they don't get along. What about the oil that's in the south? And what about the fact that when United Nations resolutions were made, let's move in a little bit more quickly than Dafur, Canada was reluctant. Because Canada is a major investment in the oil. And China said nothing, don't intervene at all, because China gains its main amount of oil that's necessary for industry from the Sudan. So when you look at public policy issues like conflict, go a little bit more deeply at what the causes are. The East West conflict, of course, had tremendous consequences in terms of the conflict, set one section of the country off another, set one country off against another. The Horn of Africa playground of the United States and the Soviet Union. Angola, uh, the playground of the United States. It was an incredible thing that happened that uh, uh, Standard Oil, I believe it was, had heavy investments in oil of Angola. Uh, the United States was not supportive of the ruling party in Angola but supportive of the anti-communist party because it was a more socialist party in power. The anti-communist power was of India. But they needed to get, and this is revealed in a lot of the congressional reports, CIA support for Zivimbi. They couldn't give it directly, so they gave it through Mobutu and Zaire. Uh, one of the reasons that he stayed in power so long. So what you had is that the Soviets then came in to help this socialist country of Angola by bringing in and paying Cuban troops. So what you had was American investments being protected against American armaments by communist troops. It's a strange thing. But an example of how conflict, public policy, has to be seen in its history. Has to be seen how it plays out. And of course, conflict is promoted by arms sales. Want to end some of the conflict and the public policy problem in, in Africa? Cancel all arms sales. The five major arms exporters in the world, the five members of the Security Council, not promoting much security. The Pope called it in uh, his own comments on the arms trade an obscenity, the arms trade. 